Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever episode of Concept Corner where creativity is key. Yeah, this is a brand new series we talked about in the past where we sit around and discuss uh, possible sequels or remakes or things that have been said to be coming out that we know for sure and what we ex would expect or like to see in them. And today's uh, episode is the first of a series of videos uh, talking about Gen 8 Pokemon on the Switch. Oh yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the things we want to see, whether it's returning features, new features, ideas that we come up with that we think would work, and how we might streamline them. Uh, if we were in charge, but we're not, sadly. But Pokemon Company, if you're listening, Game Freak, come on. We got ideas. They're going to be good. <laughs> we're a top quality idea, man. Yes. And we'll approve that over the next six episodes? Uh, yeah, I believe right now we have it slated for about six episodes on the little, my little... Yeah, we're going to be trying to do this all in one go, but we're going to split them up into, into little episodes each. We don't know how long these are going to last uh, individually. We're going to try to keep them as short as possible for you because we understand some people have really bad attention spans, and we apologize for that. We kind of do once in a while, but we have a lot to talk about with Pokemon uh, because there's a lot of things with this jumping to such a massive system compared to your hand has like 3DS and that to the Switch. It's a massive jump. Well, we even talked about... Uh work on the pre-up to this episode, just the difference between the amount of data that can be held on, on an individual cartridge on the Switch as compared to the 3DS, which I think 3DS was like, what, 3.2 gigs? At like the that? very least, that's how big the file was for sudden move each. And we, and we already know that they pushed the 3DS about as hard as they could push it. Now they're saying for Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon coming out here next month, Dating this video already, wow. that they're that they're going to be they're going to push kind of the last bit they can out of that system, but we're still running to the area where 3.2 gigs is probably about as much as you can really fit onto the game card. However, for the Nintendo Switch, those uh, those cartridges hold what you say 16? 16, as far as I remember from a recent interview with the people at Doom with Bethesda, uh, because of uh, how much they're going to put onto the cartridge, plus why the multiplayer is going to be separate. So we've got we so we've got actually exactly if 3.2 is the cap, then that's exactly five times more space to work with for a, for a full 3D Pokemon Switch game. And honestly, I don't feel like you need to turn the graphics up that much. No, uh, it... <laughs> that's definitely something we're going to talk about. In fact, in this first episode, we're going to be discussing uh, our idea of what might be an interesting place to set the region. A uh, little bit about what we want to see as far as rivals. Not too in depth, not going to go that far, but also talking about graphics and uh, interface changes. It needs to have green eyes and a Leo. Just have a soft spot for Leo, so shut up. <laughs> uh, as well as oh, about online and offline functionality. So. <laughs> this is why this is going to be a little more impromptu. We did say we were going to script this, but we realized that isn't going to happen with us, especially with him. So it's just easier to make it more bullet points and discuss it as go. You know, it, it, we're touch and go on a lot of our stuff, but I think we can, with the magic of editing and focusing ourselves, make it more concise. So we're going to do our best, so please stick with us for these next six uh, part series. As uh, we build for you our dream Pokemon game. Let's check it out. First of all, as far as the region, we had been thinking about what might be an interesting place to set the next Pokemon games. Those are about, what, France, New York, different uh, regions of Japan. Mm -hmm. I think we've had... Uh, at least three or four different regions. Yeah, based on like uh, the Kanto region in Japan. Yeah, Kanto and Johto are from, are from Japan. I believe so was, I want to say, Hoenn was or Sinnoh Sino. was? Sinnoh was, was a lot more, uh, I, I guess, mountain ranging. Yeah. So it might be more closer to Hokkaido. Don't I, me on this. I don't know the layout. Of, I, I don't know Jian. Uh, I don't know Japan's geography well enough to say. There, there's it, a it, lot it, of prefixtures. Yeah. So it, it's one thing where I'm not sure at least three of the generations have been based more around uh, Japan, whereas the others were based around more tropical areas yeah. or other parts of the world, with Sun and Moon also being Hawaii, the most recent one. Our thought was, why not go towards the Scandinavian regions? In fact, we took the idea of three countries, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, making them into a single region, and based the story around three countries that were war that found peace and formed the region of Denos. And we figured that uh, those three uh, countries 
have a lot of uh, good history to them that we could actually play around with the Pokemon designs, as well as the mythology, as some Norse mythology, to play around with the legendaries and other such Pokemon, as well as stories and the development of the culture. And the one thing that we looked at when it kind of came to making a region as well was the climate in that area. And there's a lot of temperate climate, mountain ranges, fields, valleys. It's a very wide, it's a very, uh, there's a very wide range of different types of climate you can play with within that region. And of course, since this is Pokemon, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna stretch want to, to, to yeah, stretch the truth, add in some stuff. Because I know there's no Scandinavian deserts, but I kind of feel like you need it a little bit. So, so you know, as far as, uh, as far as even the, um, you know, the other regions where they, you know, they, they took liberties. So, kind of do the same thing here. Add in icy areas, add in, add in biomes that you need Volcanic to areas, in. stuff like that. Yeah, to fit in things. It doesn't have to be exactly, you know, just we, like... We know, you know the world's very close to how the real world is, but not exactly. Right. You know, it mentions real world places. Uh, yeah, because Lieutenant Surge is referred to as the Lightning American in the first gen. And then we had Unova, which is based on America, on America. so is he the Lightning Unovan? Or is America or America existing somewhere separately from Unova and from Kalos? Well, that's Rather what... Kalos, well, Kalos is driving in Al Alola, yeah. since I'm assuming those are two different regions not connected. Well, New York and Hawaii. Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know. But they're very close. Uh, with, like, Kanto is very close to Hawaii, and Japan's closer to Hawaii, so it makes some sense. Yeah. Look at that point, but we're we're a little off topic on that one. But the point was, we wanted to describe what Denos was in our minds, going beyond just the region as far as how to describe that. Looking at something like rivals, we would love to see uh, the concept of the rival being a little bit more prominent than it has in recent generation, where they're all everyone's all buddy buddy. Sun and Moon got it the closest to right. what we want with the two kinds of rivals: the more friendly one and the more antagonistic. Uh, Gladian. I don't know his name, Gladian. Yeah. He was a lot more antagonistic, but he was very much like a Chinebio. He's constantly doing his little like hand gesture things. Like he's some cool badass, which is fine for a character concept, but he was not initially your friend. He was your enemy. And I want to have that kind of like, just like someone like Silver, who's just not your friend. You can befriend them as time goes on, but they won't. But he wants to kick your butt! He wants to be champion. He wants to be better than you. Oh, Gary Oak. Yes. You know, you're very, blue. You're very much in the vein of the of the older rivals, where they're more antagonistic and less, yeah. less how. How's fine. He's good. He's a nice trainer and all. And don't completely throw him out, but even when it comes to the more friendly <sighs> trainer, I would like for him to be a bit more aggressive and, and take, take things a bit more seriously. A little bit more like... Um, the from primary, Gen 5. yeah, the primary rival from uh, well, I guess Gym Five works. Yeah, from, from, from Black and White One, not Two. Right, because Two was on under Defense. Well, even Gen, even Gen Six, I thought had a had a pre, uh, pretty dis, uh, decent main rival. She wasn't bad. I agree. I, and I'm sorry for forgetting names. We'll have to put some out here because it's hard to remember the actual names for the alternate versions of your character. I can never sometimes. remember who's supposed to be Sun, who's supposed to be Moon, who's supposed to be Boy Girl. Yeah, yeah, Boy Feminine Sun's masculine. Oh yeah, that actually is a traditional thing. Uh, but the point is, we want the rivals to be a little bit stronger, but we, as far as character building, we want them to be more friendly rival and antagonistic rival, rather than like really happy go lucky. He's hungry all the time, like Al was. <laughs> that got annoying to me. Right. How's well, not terrible, but he's just no, not interesting. I, yeah, I, I, I don't hate how he's a good kid. Wally he was, was a interesting. fine character. Wally was very interesting because we, he went through a whole character arc and became stronger, more confident. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind seeing a, a Wally-esque arc for the for the the, the friendly arrival. Of course, the friendly arrival would be the rival that takes the Pokemon that that uh, that's weak to yours. And of course, the antagonistic rival is going to take the one that's strong to your or to yours. That way, he's a uh, it's a harder fight whenever you meet him, even though that doesn't often hold up once you've got a full team of six anyway. Yeah. But the point is, it would actually add more to the story, and the story is where Pokemon tends to suffer a lot anymore. However, one main reason we're talking about having two rivals is to introduce a new type of battle. We everyone remembers from Sun and Moon where we added Battle Royale. Mode. That was your four-way fight. The mode that could have been. But why have only four? And we have we stop at double battles. We're fighting 1v1 and 1v3. Why not a 1v2? Why not triple threat? Where essentially you have three trainers all competing to try and come out on top. A last man standing type match. 
So your first your first introduction to a triple threat battle would of course be your introductory uh, fight between all the rivals, where you've got uh, yourself pitted against your the antagonistic rival, and then your and then the friendly rival, and everyone's competing to knock uh, to knock out everyone or to knock out each other's Pokemon, and last Pokemon standing wins the bout. This is a good way to teach your newer trainers a bit about the triangle system with your type advantages and disadvantages. Exactly. So you have your water, fire. And grass, so you are have your water type that you might be strong against fighting against the fire type that it's strong against, and vice versa. And they'll try to you know show the differences. Mind you, at this point, it's going to be set to kind of an easy uh, AI for that match because we're looking at teaching new trainers. Yeah, we can even have the uh, the current uh, regional professor explaining in the fight. Hey, look out for uh, you! Look out for that rival. His moves are super effective against you, and he uses his fire attack against your grass type. Boom! Big hit. Just a good overall explanation for hey, this is how weaknesses and uh, you know weaknesses and and, and, uh, and uh, resistances work. I the word there. <laughs> well, another I'm trying I, to say weaknesses and strengths. So. Now, another thing I would do is before the battle begins is the fresh infusion potions. So while you're learning, yeah, you're probably going to take some damage, you can heal up. Yeah. And that will teach you the points and items as well. So again, while this would seem a little bit tedious for older players like us, and maybe you, newer players, such as, you know, my kids, for instance, right, in which they understand Pokemon basics already, but there are other people who, like us, have kids, or have nieces and nephews, or people that have never played before. It's a good way to teach them these early base mechanics that go to a Pokemon school somewhere. And this one fight does have something new for veteran players. There's never been a triple threat match, you know, outside of the the, the 4v4, uh, you know, battle royale modes. Well, even then, it's not a triple threat because once one person is down, that's it. Yeah, it's still introducing a, a, a oh, yeah. new concept as well as giving you the tutorial on basics and how to use Pokemon. Exactly. Now, another thing we need to talk about, though, is graphics. Like we were just discussing earlier, we don't need uber realistic, high end graphics. It's a Pokemon. If anyone's ever seen some of the artwork that shows up, that shows up on say, like DeviantArt, that sort of thing, there's people who do specialize in what you know real world looking Pokemon would look like, and quite frankly, they're freaking horrifying. So we don't need to go that far. Plus, there's an interesting art, or there's an interesting thing that happens with games as they age. Ones that are done in a, in a more art, with a more artistic style age way better. Pokemon's especially one of those games. If you look at the style of a Pokemon, the design of a Pokemon, they have stayed relatively the same generation to generation. But when new artists come in or new leads for the products or for projects, there are changes to that style, but they're different enough to be noticeable, but still hold that same base concept of, you know, the softer eyes yeah. as time has gone on. They're, they have less B2 rough eyes and more softer rounded eyes. But you still have the real kind of cartoon design. Some are bigger, some are rounder, some are a little more square. But they're basic designs. So we don't need to go too much more in, in depth with the 3D models than what we really already have. Oh, yeah. Or, at most, uh, 3D models that you've seen from past games like Battle Revolution and or Poke Coliseum Tournament. and Pokemon Tournament. But I don't think for the art style you want to go a whole lot more crazy with the graphics than that. Yeah. Which helps us because that also opens up more data for us to use with things like story, systems, and mini games. Or even better, camera. Because <laughs> in this game we want to have a camera that is free roam. You complete 3D turn around the world is a world. It's not just looking at a screen and just however the camera angles and it's 3D depending on where the camera automatically goes. You control the camera. And therefore can take pictures of your Pokemon along the journey, adding in that niche for the people who've been begging Nintendo and I'm among that crowd to please, please give us more Pokemon Snap. So now you can take pictures in game of just your surroundings or yourself, your character, your Pokemon, just for fun. That's all it is. You just take your take a snapshot and save it since we have uh, some newer functions that were recently brought into the Switch, with you be able to record video and do stuff like that. You can take your snapshots in game and save them to your uh, video cards. Or perhaps upload them to social media and show people on Facebook, Twitter, uh, wherever it is you happen to be hanging out at. Hey, look at what I did in you know in Pokemon. And by the way, that's free advertising. Or even better, why not have certain little things you can take pictures of? that only show up in certain areas, like some are just outside the boundaries of the game in a certain area. There's a Lapras or a group of Lapras swimming past and you take a picture and you capture it. Little hidden gems like that, that you could put in. 
if you, if you encounter a mountain range, you can't pass over. Maybe if you look up, you can see Zubat floating around, or maybe a Tyranitar hanging out up there, or, you know, Geodude and Graveler hanging out on the side of the mountain. Do whatever it is they do. Just Pokemon living and breathing in a world where not every Pokemon is hidden behind, you know, in the grass or behind a boulder somewhere. Yeah, this is stuff you can have in your cities or certain in-between areas. You know, where it's not that you can encounter them, they're just flavor. Yeah. There's a little bit of flavor added to the world to make it feel alive. Which is what I've been seeing from a lot of the images for Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon, where you have like the, the wing gull flying by. Yes. Or Pokemon just one around that you can talk to and interact with. That is what we want to see with that kind of camera function and as far as the graphics and what to see in the world. However, the one thing that is most important to any game outside of graphics is interface. Oh, yes. So we want to have a good upgrade to the interface. Now, we don't want to change everything too drastically. So your face buttons, your A, B, X, and Y are still going to remain the same. You're interacting with A, B for when you want to run or cancel out of something if you don't want to go, go down and hit A. Uh, X would be still for uh, bringing up your menu. A lot of your basic controls should should remain how they've been across the generations. That way, when you jump into this brand new uh, game on a brand new console, it doesn't feel as foreign to you. You're oh, not yeah. as, you're actually going, okay, crap, they moved all my buttons around, what's doing what? So keep a lot of your basic interface the way it was. Your uh, plus button is, is now your stand-in for your start button. Yes, yes. Your select button is now your quick, your quick tool or whatever, or, or, or your, your, so you can pull out your, say your, uh, is that what we discussed? Your bike, that kind of thing? No, 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 no. It was? No, select, the select button or the minus button would actually bring up money. Oh, so right. you're going to talk about more later as well. But yeah, the, the aspect of the function of the, the plus and minus buttons being menus that you can use for different things, uh, such as with the aspect of picking your, your right Pokemon, much like inside of Moon, and dictating to your your D-pad, your up, down, left, and right, since they don't have a full D-pad on the Switch. But you have your up, down, left, right buttons on the uh, left side controller. So you can put them there, or just bring up the list and pick the one you want, because touchscreen. You've got the entire touchscreen uh, interface that you can play with for use when sorting out your team, because Lord knows I do a lot of switching the position of my team in, in, in combat, as well as using items from the menu, and the touch screen is just so much easier to organize. Than up and down and sorting through it, because you can swipe all that good stuff that we're all very exactly. used to. Hey everyone, sorry for ending the video, but there was kind of an issue when we recorded this, and that was we kind of omitted something. We forgot to talk about the battle interface, and it's kind of a big thing to skip over. So, since this was more my baby in the discussion originally, I decided to go ahead and record this uh, nice little addendum and uh, insert the video right here. So sorry past uh, Xanderson Drifter for interrupting your flow, what little you had. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the battle interface since, well, we forgot. And the main reason this is something that needs to be discussed is this is the first time since the original Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald that Pokemon's going back to a single screen. It's been two screens since Gen 4 with Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum. So we've been really used to, or at least very pleased, most of the newer players to the series have been used to having a top and bottom screen where the bottom screen was your entire interface and the top was more the display and all the action and excitement. They didn't have to interact up here, it was all down here. Well, now it's all on one screen. And that can be a big problem if you don't know what you're doing. You end up overcrowding a screen. We don't want to do that. So with the help of my very own Switch, I'm going to kind of give you a really quick rundown of how you can improve the battle interface on the Switch when transferring from the two screen system with the 3DS. So when you look at this system, we have a bigger screen to work with, so you can get a little more room. Uh, I know we'll end up having the ability to show multiple Pokemon, at least two or three per battle, depending on you know, what they bring back. Uh, we know how the displays generally work. It's usually you know, HP, the different Pokemon teams, how many Pokemon the opponents have, stuff like that. We know all this. But how do we get all the different stuff that's on the bottom screen to the top without cluttering? My solution would be drop menus. I know that sounds like a really dirty word, but frankly, it's the only way to really do it in a reasonable way. Now, there's two ways we can handle the drop menus. Uh, one would be with buttons. Well, obviously, with button inputs, it's very easy. Now, I wouldn't use any of the face buttons to activate the drop menus. I would actually use the shoulder buttons. So let's go ahead and discuss uh, using the option of the four shoulder buttons. 
So we have up here uh, R1, for instance, which I would suggest be run. It's actually one of the easiest, uh, more accessible of the shoulder buttons here. So it's just, I want to run R1 right there. Nice and easy. Do it in your sleep or half asleep, which some of us tend to do. We start playing late in the night and like going into like a, a robot mode. So it's just running, running. Makes it easy. I uh, want to drop down the actual battle menu, which is where you want to bring up your uh, movesets. R2, it's right there, it drops down, and you can go ahead and use either the uh, different little things here to select, so your up and down buttons right here, or you can use your joystick, or even better, touch screen, because touch screen, use it. But I think that would be really easy for the run of battle options right here. When you activate it, it just drops down here on the side, like we've been used to, uh, moves have usually been on this side, on average, or at least have the accessible here, so it's one button to the screen, just drop it right here. Nice and easy. On the other side here, we would have uh, switching Pokemon, nice and simple, boom, right here, L1. Tap it, brings it up, it'll cover the whole screen for a moment, which is fine. Since you're switching Pokemon, you don't really need to look at everything. Uh, the one thing I would suggest that if you did do it that way, would be the uh, HP for your opponent visible, so you know what you're getting to keep an eye on that kind of thing. That way you can just kind of tap, you know, whatever like that, or you can just select like normal. I think that'd be pretty easy. As far as items, L2, drop menu straight down, you can pick your items. Uh, I would also keep uh, the ability to just kind of you know, scroll it, obviously. Uh, you can have the favorites, so you just hit that and go like your favorite items were most recently used, and it's right there. Nice and simple, keep it off to the side. I don't know how specifically I would want to organize some of that. Uh, but I think it would be just a lot easier to go for a drop menu. Maybe have the option up here in the corner, you just tap it and it'll drop. So you don't have to always use the shoulder buttons. Uh, if you're worried about, you know, when you're half asleep hitting this by accident, you just want to do it like this, that's fine. Uh, like I said, this is a really short section. It was just uh, something we forgot to talk about, and it is important to talk about battle menus. Uh, so, drop menu suggestion, it's right there, simple to use. And for, you know, those late nights where you're playing, and you don't want to hold it, and you just have it plugged in uh, to your TV. So right here, you just kind of, nice and simple, nice and easy. Uh, and that's what we want to do here. Uh, so thanks for humoring me. Uh, sorry for your video. And uh, yeah, back to us. So it's just little things like that. If you want to activate your camera whenever you want, L1 button, right there. It brings up the camera option, and you can use either the joystick to guide around through camera, or when you're in camera mode, if you want the option, gyroscope to move around as you need be. Because we're looking at the function of the switch itself, which is a decent system as far as power goes, and as far as basic functionalities that it has inherent to it, that the 3DS also had, the gyroscope. We want to use whatever we can, however much we can, to make the games unique, interesting, and first time. I can remember getting in trouble with one of my roommates uh, back at the time. I was playing Pokemon Dream Radar, and if you oh, remember, yeah. you could spin this thing around to see the Pokemon, but they could sometimes go behind you. So I'd sat in my computer chair in the <laughs> middle of my room, around. it was spinning around. He comes in to see what I'm doing, and I've just got this, this DS in front of my face going, Where are you at? <laughs> Where did you go? Yeah. But, but that was fun, and it was an experience, and why not bring that into the Pokemon world, which feels like you're standing there in the world trying to get a picture of this Pidgey flying around your head, like, hold still, you little... <laughs> <laughs> but the, the interface needs some minor improving, but we also have more button options, and we have a little bit more power behind us, so we can flesh things out a little bit better on the interface. But the, that kind of interface, your basic interface, doesn't need that much changing. To be honest, however, I would say when it comes to one thing, your key items where it's connected to your Y button, the Y button brings up a mini menu. We can have up to three items: your fishing rod, your bike, if you want to have one, which we may or may not have one. Don't know yet, but it's an option. But at least have up to three items they can do. It's like boop, and then you pick one. Honestly, I feel like riding Pokemon these days have almost supplanted the bike. Yeah, but you know, we can always have one in different form. But we don't, we haven't really thought about a bike in this one. It's just something that Pokemon can use if they want to for their games. If they want to simplify and have a bike. That way you can have it there. It's like, boop, and you have multiple options around there. Okay, I have to select this one. Okay, I want to switch this other thing. So I have a fish inside to build a start menu. Go to the item, highlight it, switch it to this. And it's less menu uh, playing, which I think all this will be happening with. It's true, Lenny. So you just quickly go to. Yeah get to the item and, and continue on with your journey. Yeah. But 
we're, we're about done with the subject we'll talk about in this one. Uh, there's one more small subject we're going to talk about really quick for this episode, and that is the online and offline functionality. Uh, we want the connectivity since the Switch is very easy, generally, to connect to other Switches locally. Have up to a max of eight, like uh, with Splatoon, so you can do uh, eight people at once. And the reason you want to do that is for our new tournament mode. Essentially, these are these are player tournaments. If you've got eight friends that all play, or that all play, uh, you know, Pokemon Generation Eight, Pokemon on the Switch, whatever we want to call it, uh, you get everybody together. You say, "All right, we're going to have ourselves a tournament." The eight people, the eight people, jump in, and you set, you just go to your menu, you set up a tournament. This might be in another area. We don't know for sure where we put this <laughs> just yet. We want to talk about it here because we have so much to talk about in the other episodes. Uh, but with this tournament, you can have up to eight people. You start it up, you set it up, and then you have like in other games where you hit the left and right bumpers to say, hey, register these controllers or register the system, and it would register you in as one of the spots. And then the tournament starts up, and you watch each match. Each person goes through their matches, and you, the player, can spectate the other people as they're playing. Cheer them on, wish them luck. It would also be neat if during the if all the trainers that were taking part in the tournament, even if they weren't on the battlefield, were standing in the sidelines so you could see everyone cheering for your Pokemon when it's time for you to go. Just send little frills in the background to make it feel like more of a living thing. Plus, you, plus you can sit there and go to your friends like, hey, see that hat I got? <laughs> yeah, that is true. You wouldn't believe what I had to do to go through, what I had to go through just to get that freaking hat. But just yeah, we'll think a little bit like social thing. Yeah, you can sit here, you can cheer on your whoever you think is going to win. You can vote who you think is going to win, too. And that could add a little help to another function we'll talk about later. But the point is to have that functionality. And the same thing is, with online functionality, you can do the same thing, that same kind of tournament. So you can have these kind of tournaments online with your friends or locally, even at a local shop, if you want to hold your own tournaments there, if you're a shop owner. So there's different things you can do with this kind of online and offline functionality with the connectivity of the Switch. So that's really... What we're looking at here is trying to bring this into the future. And with the future comes change and new mechanics, like we discussed, but there's one mechanic we've not discussed yet, and that's a status effect. So we want to end this on an interesting one. Something brand new, something you guys haven't heard of before, and a silly idea we came up with while discussing potential legendaries and interesting, uh, interesting abilities and things they can do. We thought up the fear mechanic. And the idea behind fear is certain moves will basically unnerve your Pokemon and rattle them. And rather than how it worked in, the, in previous games where that would either cause you to use more power points or not be able to use a held item, instead we thought that fear could be a proper status in and of itself. And what happens is the, you know, the opposing Pokemon uses a move that terrifies you know your Pokemon, and then when your Pokemon goes to attack, it's got a uh, 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 it's got a one in three chance. Of being a, uh, of basically losing that attack to fear. What happens when it loses its attack is rather than just missing or is paralyzed from fear, sort of the way uh, attraction works, where oh you're immobilized by love. That's neat. That's cool. That's an existing thing. Let's not clone it. Instead, let's bring back a mechanic that a lot of trainers don't even see these days with how fast the games go. When a poke, when your Pokemon, uh, when you have a trainer Pokemon to you, they don't have enough badges to train. There's a slim chance every time you tell it to use a move that rather than using the move you told it to use, it uses a uh, uses another random move from its move pool instead. So when a Pokemon is afflicted by fear, there's a one in three chance that it panics, and instead of using the the move you told it to use, it freaks out and uses any other move in its move pool. Wait, that brings up something very interesting as far as strategy. So we have poison. You have paralysis. You have sleep, and now you have now you have fear, which fear could be could be uh, similar to uh, uh, fear could be uh, similar to attraction and confusion, where it's not necessarily something you heal, but if you switch the Pokemon out, switch them back in, they've calmed down, and now they're ready to go again. Thereby, you could have a Pokemon that, that is paralyzed and feared, or a Pokemon that is confused and feared, mm -hmm. and it only lasts from one to four turns. One to four turns, same as confusion. Yeah, we don't want to completely hinder people. We're going to add a new level of uh, intrigue to a battle. Yeah, of strategy and intrigue. Because Lord knows having a Pokemon use an ability you didn't want it to use, like, say, Something Thunderbolt, the Thunderbolt on, on, a, on a Jolteon that was Volt Absorb. Oh, yeah. Or Protect on a turn you didn't want to use Protect, thereby making the mischance of Protect next turn. Or, or even worse, Rest. Yeah, I mean, we already have field control kind of with uh, Confusion. This is another way to do that. Mm -hmm. So instead of them hurting themselves, they just might use the wrong move. 
Maybe they use a healing move they didn't need to use. So it's like, oh, we got heal bell. Like, what the heal there? And of course, the Pokemon that that would uh, that would normally have you know fear type attacks could easily be guys like your ghost Pokemon, your dark Pokemon, anything maybe psychic types, maybe psychic types, any, anything anything kind of scary and intimidating. In fact, I'd say any Pokemon that has the ability to intimidate should be able to learn at least one fear move. That's all we got for this episode. We have talked about it a lot. Probably rattle them off a little quick. But the point is, there is a lot to talk about. We need to get through these, and we don't want to keep you guys here too long for these episodes uh, for now. This is only episode one in a series of what we'd like to see in Generation 8, or how we build our perfect Pokemon game. Exactly. So join us again for the next episode of Concept Corner, part two of Pokemon Gen 8 for the Switch. What are we talk about? What are we going to talk about? Oh, we're going to talk about a lot of things. Returning features. So we'll see you in the next episode. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget... It's all about creativity. Have fun. We'll see you in the next one. Make sure you leave any suggestions that you, that you thought that you think we missed in the comments below. Peace.